when they, instead of just talking or assuming they know what students are thinking, they elicit and notice students' ideas. And not just, oh, thank you for your idea, moving on. They interpret those ideas and then try to adjust their instruction to build on student ideas instead of their elicitation having just been an engagement type activity. The, the classic example of this is Ball's Shaw number video, which I assume many of you have seen, where she just takes she takes a class in a whole different direction based on a student's unusual idea. So what is the responsiveness challenge? Um, plenty of research shows that novice teachers in math and science tend not to attend deeply and responsibly to their students' thinking. And that's a challenge because instruction that does attend to and build on the productive seeds in students' thinking tends to be more effective instruction. That's, again, a, a fairly established result in the literature. It's reflected in high leverage practices, ambitious science teaching, all those, all those movements. So why is this, this type of teacher responsiveness irregular or rare? <coughs> Previous literature has offered three non-orthogonal explanations. 
One is that teachers, especially novices, just don't have the skills of somebody like Deborah Ball to hear the nuances in students' thinking and draw them out and build on them. Another is you wouldn't show teacher responsiveness unless you really think that learning involves building on your prior knowledge. So if a teacher has, has more transmissionist beliefs about how students learn, they would be less, they have little reason to engage in teacher responsiveness. And then finally, um, people point to standardized tests, mile-wide inch deep curricula, and other such pressures that uh, prevent teachers from going deep with their students. Here's the points of the talk today. The first point is, I don't really believe so much in explanation one. Yes, a novice teacher isn't yet Deborah Ball, but the irregularity we see in responsive teaching and teacher responsiveness, um, we're gonna argue is not due to a complete lack of skills, it's due to teachers not turning on skills they in fact possess. And my second point is that framing a teacher's local sense of what is, what is it that's going on here can anchor an explanatory framework I'll introduce, a new framework, that does two things. It takes the three factors from the last slide and coordinates them into a more, more parsimonious explanation. And it adds new explanatory power by taking into account the moment-by-moment -moment unfolding of the classroom discourse. Interrupt? Questions? Yes. So there, um, a sort of pure study of just experience versus no experience, there's not too much of that. Most of the studies are in the context of a professional development program. Teachers who have more experience in certain kinds of professional development, that correlates with more teacher responsiveness as, a, as opposed to just number of years teaching. So it might it might turn out that um, you know other things being equal like professional development or experience does matter. It's hard to imagine Deborah Ball having been able to do what she did in that video fresh out of grad school. Um, yeah. Right, you, I, I think there'd be a consensus in the teacher education community that, that this raw experience isn't going to do it, that a readiness for PD and then good PD are, are needed. Why should we care about the teacher responsiveness challenge and a new theoretical framework to, to think about it in? Well, first of all, um, this framing anchor theoretical framework is going to invite non-deficit based views of why teachers aren't being more responsive because as good as education research has been about not attributing deficits to students, we're still more likely to attribute deficits to teachers and it's good to, good to fight against that. Um, also, there's a small body of work by Rosemary Russ and colleagues showing that how teachers frame their local classroom interactions and shifts in those framings are associated with and probably causally related to shifts in teacher responsiveness. So given that emerging work, it's, it's theoretically worthwhile to flesh out a framework that can subsume previous types of explanations into framing. 
And then finally, professional development stemming from a framing-based view of what's going on with teachers is going to look very different from professional development that attributes deficits to students. So we want to flesh out what those differences would look like. All right. Here's, here's my game in this talk. I'm not just going to present this new <coughs> theoretical framework. I'm going to start with a case study of a particular teacher, go into some detail on how he was more responsive in one class and less responsive in another. Then I'm going to introduce the theoretical framework grounded in that particular data to make it more concrete. Then I'm going to look at a second case study of another teacher um, that will illustrate some nuances of the, of the theoretical framework that didn't come out as well from the first case study. So let's jump right into some data. Mr. L came through our teacher certification program at Maryland and teaches high school physics. He has good uh, physics content knowledge. Um, and he was teaching on a day we videotaped him, uh, a class on optics. And what I'm going to tell you about this optics class was very typical of like three or four different classes we observed him doing over the years. So this is not cherry picked. This is representative of his typical teaching. So a common thing he would do is introduce new information and then check students, check if students are with him by asking fairly close-ended questions. So a typical exchange, he'd just introduce angle of incidence equals angle of reflection for the physics nerds out there. And so are students getting that? What would be the angle of incidence here? Evan answered zero. That's right. Why is it zero and not 90? Because the normal is also the same. That's right. We're measuring blah, 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 and he explained why that's the right answer. So notice he's asking questions, but they're kind of close ended, and then he's sort of checking whether students are on the right track or not, using it to explain the material a little more. And another thing he does, he does make space in his class for students to ask questions. Um, and what he does is directly answer them. So Pete asks, is that also why they say objects in the mirror may seem closer than? And before Peter can finish the answer, Mr. L, who knows his content really well, says, yes, objects may be closer than they appear in a curved mirror because it shrinks them. And he explains why when you, when an image is smaller, your brain codes that as it's being further away. Um, he doesn't explain in this moment why the curved mirror makes the image smaller. That's going to come in a few days. So focusing in on his, his uh, kinds of responsiveness in, these, in this style of instruction, note that his questions, instead of inviting deep reasoning or debate, are inviting brief responses. And what he's attending to in the responses is <coughs> if students are, are on the right track or not. So for instance, when Evan says, because the normals also, why is it zero and not 90, Evan? Evan says, because normals also the same. Not clear what that means, but he doesn't, he doesn't flesh that out. He sort of assumes, yeah, that student seems to be getting it. That's right, and goes on. And we'll move on pretty quickly to the next topic. Another facet of this relevant to teacher responsiveness is he's asked what, what a physics teacher knows to be a really rich question, the kind of question we love to throw back at students to get them talking about. But it's not part of this getting through the material uh, classroom style to, <coughs> to invite that. 99% of the time, he just answers the question. Yeah. Um, he's at a school with uh, mixed socioeconomic and ethnic students. Um, the physics class, though, is more disproportionately upper class and white 
and the school as a whole, and that's through seeking care. So overall, this is a, a case of kind of limited responsiveness in the teaching, as I defined responsiveness earlier. So how would the previous literature account for this lack of responsiveness? Well, just marching through the explanations, we could say he just doesn't have the, the eliciting and listening skills or pedagogical content that would be needed to hear the interesting stuff in previous reasoning and draw it out. We could say he has uh, somewhat transmissionist beliefs about how students learn, that, that showing them stuff and then checking if they understand is, is going to result in good learning. Um, or we could say it's, it's time constraints. He's got material he has to get through for his high school curriculum, and he'd love to teach another way, but he can't. Let's check those explanations against what we saw in one unusual class we videotaped that year. We also videotaped from teaching the same lesson in subsequent years, and it was always the same. So again, this is gonna be representative. He picked out this cool figuring physics problem from the physics teacher. Um, you can read that briefly. The girl is going to So it's a tricky conceptual physics question. And let's look at how that class went. So here's a little bit of dialogue I'll walk, walk through. A multiple choice. I'm going to assume that the height she reaches on the far side from where she started is going to be less than the final height she gets to, but that that final height will be equal to the initial height. So, and he said, if she doesn't lose any energy, Jason's saying, then that's what would happen because fast times gravity times height, um, blah, 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 potential. She starts with MGH with the backpack. Then she's using that MGH energy to swing up. She wouldn't swing as far because the, and Mr. L breaks in, because M's bigger. Yeah, because M's bigger. So H has to be lower. And Jason says, yeah. And then once M goes back lower, when he drops the backpack on the back swing, when M goes back to being lower, then H has to be bigger. So if you can prove that she doesn't lose energy, then the answer is D. So what he's saying is complicated and not that easy to follow if you're just hearing it in real time, right? But look how he's following along and then summarizes it. Okay, so if that quantity MGH, the total energy, that product is always the same number, then Jason's got it figured out. So then for him, the question is, is MGH always the same? He's just making himself a different question to think about. It's a good question to think about. So during this exchange where students are throwing out a not fully articulate idea, he's following along, following his logic and the physics, very close listening. So he's drawing out and revoicing the student's idea and even helping the student uh, draw out those ideas himself by nudging them along the logical steps. So this is a this is quite sophisticated responsiveness in teaching. The typical novice teacher probably wouldn't be able to understand exactly what Jason is saying here. He's interpreting and revoicing Jason's contribution. He's remembering that this whole argument is on the assumption that the total energy is the same at the beginning and end. 
then a little bit later, talking to Roy, he says, we don't have the same amount of kinetic energy that we started at the beginning with. So we're saying, no, we, we lose energy in this, in this scenario. And Mr. L, this is long after he talked to Jason, but he knows, okay, so this seems to be addressing Jason's question. And Jason said, if you could show that the energy was always the same, then answer B would be correct. And you seem to think that the energy at the end is not the same. And Roy says, yeah, unless the backpack magically puts a force, I, I just don't know how it would. And Mr. L then revoices that. So a whole bunch of ideas are coming out from students. And Mr. L is tracking those ideas closely enough that he's able to bring them into contact as part of the teaching. So he's relating Roy's ideas to Jason's. And when I just show you the two ideas, that's easy, but when these are two of, of 20 ideas that have come out in this conversation, that's hard. And again, he's revoicing. So in light of what Mr. L was able to do, and again, what I just showed you is typical of what went on in the entire 50-minute class. Can we say he has underdeveloped listening and listening skills? No. He clearly has those skills. He demonstrated them for a full 50 minutes. Does he have transmissionist beliefs about how students learn? He's sure not acting like it here. He's taking the time to draw the students out and treating wrong ideas and right ideas on equal footing. But the students argue it out. Time constraints has to get through the material. In this lesson, he's not acting like time constraints are important. He lets this discussion go on for a really long time with just one question. So where does this leave us? How can we explain why he was so, his responsiveness was so different in the optics class versus the Thalia on a swing class? Um, so, you know, this, this captured the researcher's attention. Oh, and I forgot to say, um, this is, co-authored work with a, a bunch of other researchers whose names are on that the title card. I should have credited them, I'm sorry. They did most of the work. So from the other data we had about Mr. L from other classes, like what he says during class with students, from interviews we would regularly conduct with him about his teaching, we found out some key information he did indeed feel time pressure during the optics lesson, but not during the Thalia <coughs> lesson. During the Thalia lesson, this was the day before a vacation. He had gotten through the material he was supposed to have covered in the first quarter. And this was, a, this was framed for him as a review of a whole bunch of mechanics concepts. By contrast, the optics lesson was later in the year, and he has a whole bunch of uh, topics to get through before the end of the school year. He complains about that in the interview. He view, viewed optics as largely applied geometry, and therefore learning optics is a little like learning geometry. It's learning a bunch of rules and proofs. Not, I'm not endorsing that, I'm saying that's how he viewed the teaching and learning of optics. By contrast, he viewed the Thalia discussion as, <coughs> quote, a chance to have a good discussion that generates a variety of ideas. Um, to analogize, to talk about it creatively, it being the Thalia scenario, to talk about it more conceptually, to talk about it without numbers. Speaking as a physicist, it's like you, you understand how to plug in, you understand how to plug in chug. You haven't understood the problem. You don't have a rich understanding of conservation of momentum. But if you can solve a problem like we did today, the Thalia problem, where we think conceptually, that's a much richer understanding. You really understand something about how the universe works. So in the context of optics, yeah. Do you, have a, do you have a plug? Oh, shoot. <laughs> That's a good 
I think I think this is we're starting right now. Yeah, trying to try to make excitement. Just in time. If this were a movie, there'd be one second before it literally exploded. <laughs> So when talk, when thinking about optics, he thinks of it about as as teaching rules and and math. When he's thinking about the Thalia lesson, he's he's thinking about learning physics as getting a rich, deeper conceptual understanding, not just knowing plug each other rules. So using those additional clues we got from the data, how can we explain the variability in teacher responsiveness between these two classes. So now, given this, this Mr. L data, uh, I'm going to start to introduce the, the theoretical framework that we think helps. And this is 99% stolen from work with David Hammer and others, um, which is stolen from DeSessa, which is stolen from Minsky. So, um, the basic assumption is, is that Mr. L doesn't have an epistemological belief about how students learn or a way of teaching. He has a whole bunch of, of different cognitive resources in his head um, that form a complex system and that aren't all turned on at the same time. So he has a a bunch of cognitive resources that can turn on and cohere with each other and form locally coherent networks. One of those networks corresponds to his more transmissionist belief exhibited in the, in the optics lesson. Another network of his epistemological resources coheres into a more constructivist belief in the Thalia lesson. So he doesn't just, he doesn't have constructivist belief or transmissionist belief. He has both, in a sense, that get activated in different contexts. But it's much more complicated than just what's going on with epistemology. These networks of epistemological resources that get activated which ones get activated and stabilized are both affect and are affected by the skills and knowledge that, that are brought to bear. You don't use all your skills at once, you need a subset of them, right? So the idea is, let's say for whatever reason, your transmissionist belief is turned on. The skills that you're gonna activate in that moment in the teacher is explaining things well, right? But it's not just one directional. But in that moment, uh, the action affects the cognitive resources. So it's a two way, mutually reinforcing direction between the transmission. And the ex explaining behavior. Similarly, for constructivist beliefs and listening, obviously, if in a given moment you're thinking it's important to build on student ideas, you're going to turn on your. Yeah. A reflexive relationship. They turn on together or mutually reinforce each other, the constructivist beliefs and the, the associated listening skills. But wait, there's more. The constraint and the teacher's perception and feeling about the So in the optics lesson.
So notice that the three explanations offered by the previous literature for the irregularity of teacher responsiveness not viewed as unitary rock solid things, viewed as variegated resources that come together and reinforce each other in different ways in different moments. What the heck does all this have to do with framing? I haven't mentioned framing at all in this explanation. Remember, framing, this is from Gottman and, and Tannen and sociolinguistics literature, is your sense of what is it that's going on here in a particular moment. So, for instance, a um, classic example from Dawkins, when you go to a fancy restaurant versus a fast food restaurant, you just, without even thinking about it, behave differently, right? Without asking yourself, where should I go? You know in McDonald's, you just walk up to the counter. You know in the fancy restaurant, you wait until somebody wants you. Um, you and you know you're going to wait for the waiter. And you know that the way you're going to get the information about what you went to the kitchen is through the waiter. And there's all these ways we know how to behave automatically. And you've compiled this into uh, fancy restaurant framing that can come on and unconsciously guide your behavior. Or it could be more conscious. It's like, oh, I thought this was more of a fast time moment. This is fancy. Okay, I guess we'll sit down. So some kind of disruption to your framing can occur and switch you to a new frame. Where is that in all of this? So it is cognitive toy model. Toy means oversimplified to the point of ridiculousness, but that's the best I can do. And this toy model of what's going on cognitively for Mr. L in the optics versus the failure lesson. We model framing as an emergent property of the activated junk reinforcing resources. Because um, remember, cognitive complex systems, complex systems, some things don't correspond to elements, they correspond to emergent properties, how do birds form flocks and the like. So, and this is where things are going to get haywire. Here's our final incomprehensible model of what's going on for Mr. L in the optics. <laughs> So, in the optics lesson, the skills for explaining the concept of optics is Mathematical 
really hurt to be friends. Still in the contrast, you know, most people are like, turned on by these particular moralities and that particular This arrangement of what's going on in the past, this emergent capitalism, was structured by So it's not just that it's not just that it's explaining skills being turned on is is Something to activate this planning and uh, unpacking the process of the new world. That once you've been determined, you have to make sure that you have the process in place to help ensure the transition to the new world help lead to the framing of covering the content of a lot of local cultural <laughs> And that framing further forms the way that we have to think about the transition to the new world. So all these Directionalities indicate what about things outside of town? Now, this is really about home land. So, the school power reference is in the area. Um, for optics, again, this is typical of the optical support. Uh, one of the Reinforces this framing. He's actually going to talk about the relationship between Your attitude towards the material, and he doesn't like objects, he likes mechanics. Uh, so, which would, what, or they all can trigger. Yeah. 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 Much more consciously aware of the
Right? Hypothetically, you can test it easily by giving a teacher a test, all the content knowledge in this on that subject, and see and, and you know assess uh, the knowledge after you observe, you know, and you you know, teacher, right? You observe and right. see where what the person switched or didn't switch or anything, yeah. and then give, you know, a, a really nice test that only you can design, but you can design a test that will really probe the understanding of the content. And then we can see, uh, you know, if it is the understanding of the content. Again, we still don't know whether the content makes you more or less, yeah. right? But at least yeah. you can uh, validate this assumption, you know, that content knowledge here is better. And then you'll see, oh, it's still in one case, it's uh, he does this or she does this and you know, he does this, and then you can rule it out. Inadequate content. <laughs> 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 
Butler would say, uh, transition is good for sexual and human conditions and life. But we can transition is good there, but there's a whole lot of changes and conditions when they look I should have to read this set of stuff, and those are the conditions when they look at the You don't go and stop and have a hard time and put an hour in the field with the person. So Because they have a much more limited transition <coughs> time to do that. But what's a, what is the possible business model of how to incorporate the current oval to introduce a new oval of meta level and a mission that? Was that you know, given what we know about Alex?
So the teacher knowing, for example, that every child can be two scenarios to the one concept versus being for optics, not having no oh, that level of understanding they have to build up that um, and similarly like even when it's talking to one situation I have because maybe they've seen it themselves and then that direct experience versus like you know, why or how they've seen how was successful previously in the production uh, level of experience of going through. So I, I uh, was is going to include more ovals and even which ovals are around is going to vary by teacher and student. So yeah, absolutely. The three ovals here are specifically for it's already proposed one new kind of oval and a new kind of element in the current current ovals. Julie, did you have uh, yeah I wanted to actually just print your paper. Oh? Just print your email. Oh. With the paper, yes. Now imagine the teacher, I could say, kids cannot uh, read this line of questioning as presented in the first in the object. We just can't, or we can't lecture. Mm -hmm. Who is so accustomed? Like, I can't lecture. You ask me, I, I won't be able to. I will stop and start asking. Questions because I have a habit, and so certain things if they're made habitual, yeah. Then and and that's the paper I sent you. So I'm just uh, what I want to say is that another 
it's not even an explanation, it's a completely different, uh, di di different framework that uh, he just doesn't, he, he's not, he doesn't have a habit of, he knows how to do it, but doesn't, like, we all habit. know we need to exercise, and we exercise sometimes, but we do not wake up in the morning, some of us, uh, do not wake up in the morning thinking, oh my God, I have to exercise, I can't go to work without exercise. But mm -hmm. once it becomes a habit, like, I cannot go to work without yeah. doing a workout. So if we manage to give me teachers that the second type of interaction is habitual, you don't need to think, you know, do I have time or I don't have time? Right. Do I need to cover? It's a completely different teacher, right? <coughs> so, and what I'm arguing that this takes a lot of time and effort. So, and even professional development, if you have a, a teacher who is formed and you want to do it through professional development, it's very difficult to develop a habit. It will all be a skill, uh, so they will know how to do it, but it won't be like, I cannot do it differently. That's how, that, you know what I'm trying to say? Okay. So, totally agree. Mm -hmm. This question is actually related to the next slide, so I'm going to go to it. Oh, I'm going to skip this. It's, it's the exact same story. <clears throat> the key point to get from this is the, the same old resources are in the cognitive ecology as before, but now different ones are colored in. And those different ones are corresponding to a different framing of the activity. And in an interview, he literally called it having a discussion with the students. So I, I can provide these slides to anybody who wants, wants them. So what work did framing do in, in this model that, that habits or other things wouldn't? So the model was constructed to bring in these three previous kinds of explanations and coordinate them under a, a single umbrella that takes into account the local classroom context of what's going on. And this idea of your sense of what's going on here as driving a lot of behavior is, is psychologically plausible and pretty well established in, in literature. But what I've shown you so far Far does not, this is an admission, does not add much or any explanatory power to just this. So why, did, why does bringing framing in, what does that add to just noting, look, this explaining, this transmissionist view, and this feeling of time pressure all reinforcing each other, um, you know, turning on this habit or or choosing this. So, yeah, right now, framing almost feels like a superfluous ontology. And that's where the next case study comes in. The point of this case study is to show that what framing demands, according to sociolinguistics, is close attention to the unfolding dynamics between people. Because how you frame an activity in the moment isn't just dependent on, like, what you came in with to the classroom, it's what's actually unfolding with other people. So this is from a third grade teacher 
Um, he's using some old materials from the Lawrence Hall of Science. You could spend all day talking about those. In the previous lesson, they measured water by touching it with their fingers and deciding that that wasn't accurate. So now they're getting introduced to thermometers. And importantly, she has this FOSS printout on the desk in front of her that the teacher does use A. So I'm going to show you some representative talk from the initial segment of the class this day. Um, more, lots of science. goes on. It's easier. Yes. Very good, Amanda. Okay, thank you. Any other answer why it's better to use a thermometer? Okay, Leo. Because if I put it in all the things that it's like hot or cold. Okay, what? It's telling all the things if it's like hot or cold or maybe medium stuff. Like that. Oh, okay, thank you. Who else? And there's lots of interactions like that. <coughs> and Looking at that carefully, we, just, we concluded that the framing of this segment of activity is something like solidifying key ideas. The key idea on the worksheet and it coheres with the previous day's touching water lesson is um, that thermometers gives you, gives you additional precision. So he's going over to make, to make sure the students have that. And then at the end of this segment of conversation, she says, okay, I'm going to explain this. Here inside the thermometer, this is alcohol. And here she's looking at the lesson plan, which says students must know that it's alcohol in there. What, what, do, what color usually is the alcohol? And a student says it's clear. But here they use color for the alcohol. And then here's how you actually use a thermometer. So she solidified the key ideas by asking students these questions, and then she uh, noted that she needed to talk about alcohol too. And now she's done with this part of the lesson from the lesson plan. She puts down the lesson. And in that moment, Ariel says, but I have a question but indicating uh, a bid for a possible misalignment with, with what's just been going on. Ms. A takes up that bid for a change in direction. Okay, what's your question? Oh, no. Okay. They try unplugging it and putting it back in. No, I think it's just on. Mm -hmm. How long was it off? Okay. Any questions about <laughs> right in the middle of this? So, stepping back, the point of this is to get the lesson I have a question. Okay, what's your question? I know this is only a liquid, but when you put it in something hot or cold, why does it, how could it go up or down? Uh, okay, can you please say that question again? Okay, Eugenia immediately knew what that question meant, but this is a third grade teacher who, in other interviews, said science isn't the main thing. So, but she wants to draw the student out. What does it mean? Um, for example, if you put it here, how could it, how could it, the liquid in the thermometer, move up or down? If this is alcohol, she's pointing to the alcohol, uh-huh. 
Right. So your question is why? Why the alcohol is doing this? Going up and going down? Ariel says yes. So look how much, how many turns Ms. A has devoted to unpacking what the question is. And she finally understands that it's a, it's a why question. How does alcohol do that? Oh, good question. Who knows the answer? Why? Yes, Ricky? And the class takes this up for the next segment of conversation. Listen to his ideas, okay? He says, oh, maybe they like put batteries or energy so it could go up or down. So that seems silly to us, but the idea that you would need some kind of energy to make something happen to the alcohol. Ah, so Leah, you were saying that, wait, Ricky, you were saying that you think that maybe you have batteries in here? And she points to the back. Ricky nods. And then a little later, maybe, maybe it's a special alcohol? Special alcohol. Uh-uh. And now notice that it's students talking to each other, not through the teacher. Or maybe the paint like doesn't stay like if you turn it upside down, it works all the way over here. Yeah. He said, let's see. I don't think she knew what they were saying there. I don't. Um, and I, we don't have the video of this. Oh. And she's pointing or something, the students clarified. So this feels very different from the conversation that came earlier. This is a new framing. They're collaboratively constructing causal explanations. Students and teachers all talking to each other, trying to get out ideas. And in terms of responsiveness, the teacher is <coughs> trying hard to understand what the students are saying and getting them to build on each other. So what's the point of this? Here's my explanation of how Ms. A got from her initial framing of solidifying key ideas to this new framing of collaboratively formulating attempted causal explanations. And this is very much a sort of line by line conversation analysis. Her explanation of what's inside the thermometer and what thermometers do for a living, uh, that was her closing out of that first segment of conversation. She finished reading off the, the boss sheet, she put it down. Oh, Ariel has a question. So she allows Ariel to ask her question and she carefully unpacks it over an entire slide of back and forth. It just so happens, Ariel could have asked, what could be inside a thermometer besides alcohol? Or she could have asked some other question that would be a more fact-oriented and mechanism-oriented conversation, right? But she happened to make a request for mechanism. And Ms. A invited the class to take it up. Who knows? Who knows this? And the other students do take it up. If they had turned the conversation to more fact-related stuff, that could have disrupted. So what we have is these contingent details of the way the conversation played out, leading to the emergence of this more mechanistic discussion in which Ms. A is being more responsive to the substance of students' ideas. It wasn't part of the lesson plan in class or in her notes. Um, in interviews, there was no pre-planning of it. It's something that emerged through the discourse. Yeah. It could also then so that teacher can understand the idea of itself. Um, so it wasn't necessarily, oh, well, let's use this as an opportunity for a student to build up each other's ideas, but it might have been giving her time to kind of think for herself. I'm not sure that even makes a difference because, I mean, there is a certain amount of guidance that needs to happen, but yeah. maybe it's good that it's happening anyway. So, so right. So, it's possible whether the conversation led the teacher to sort of choose this new activity or sort of like the answer. That's the 
the main point here is that we're going beyond those three previous explanations built in the framing. We're also building into framing as Goffman and Tannen insist <coughs> the unfolding conversational dynamics. So here we color it in. So this is the last slide, and it's just to reiterate the points of the talk. So with Alex or with, sorry, that's, that's also a pseudonym, with Mr. L and with Ms. A in the first part of the talk, in, in, in my initial presentation, you might think there's a lack of skills going on, but no, both of them have the skills to listen to students and draw them out of it. And then I tried to show that framing teacher sense of what's going on here anchors this complicated explanatory framework that coordinates those three previous explanations but adds explanatory power by folding in the unfolding classroom discourse and that's it thank you Uh, yeah, it was more fun really doing all that. I think there's